at all these countries. Look at all these medals. They turn around and even named a destroyer after him. You'd think I'd kind of pump his ego up, wouldn't you? No, folks. Throughout all this success, he never forgot about his belief in the scripture. His physical geography, his science textbook, had the scripture references such as Psalms chapter 8, verse 8, giving God the glory for the paths of the sea and many other things. Now, I, you may not have heard of Matthew Fontaine Murray. I know you've heard of Sir Isaac Newton. Raise your hand if you've heard of Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. He's usually considered the greatest scientist who ever lived. He made so many breakthroughs in physics, he would have been incredibly famous if he did nothing else. He made breakthroughs in calculus. Ooh, how many of y'all going to have fun with calculus when you hit college? Okay. Mathematics, he had some other type things, light and color, prisms, astronomy, gravity, yes, and the tides. All from one man? Incredible scientist. Yes, and he's around talking about the moon causing uh, the tides on Earth, no problem. But what you were probably not taught is he wrote a couple of science textbooks, but they didn't tell you about the other two books he wrote. Prophecies of Daniel. Prophecies of Daniel? Yeah. Daniel the Bible, yes. And the other book, Ancient Kingdoms. Ancient Kingdoms of the Bible. Sir Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist who probably ever lived, spent more time studying his Bible than he ever did science. They never told me that. Why don't they tell you these things, folks? Here's what he also said. He said he, he wrote papers to refute evolution and to defend creation of the Bible. And he says, I find more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than any profane history whatsoever. In other words, forget what the Greeks wrote. Forget what the wisdom of man turned around and says. The Bible is more authentic than anything out there. Why didn't they tell me that? I got a question for you. If he'd been an evolutionist spouting off 4.6 billion years from the age of the earth, and a bunch of evolutionary garbage. The newspaper would make him a hero, wouldn't it? And they'd let you know every single thing he wrote, wouldn't they? But when he turns around and raises God's word up, you think the news media gonna let you know about him? You think public schools gonna teach him? You think college is gonna bother with him? No. Is this just a fluke though? Did we turn around just, oh, you know, the Bible accidentally got it right, spherical earth, can't count the stars, springs of the sea, paths of the sea, yeah, 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 you find some scientists out there who believe in the Bible. Is this just an accident? Well, let's keep going. Remember, man is without excuse because there's so much evidence out there. Let's run a little test here. About 30% of the world claims some belief in Christianity. That's what they claim. Very few actually follow it. We know that. But if Christianity was a false religion, just like all the others, which is what the news media claims, all religions are equal. That's what they claim, right? If they're all equal, then let's look at the area of science. And any technological breakthroughs that would help you your cell phones, everything else, anything that would help you, you'd expect about 30% of all the technological breakthroughs to come from those group of people that call themselves Christians, right? If all religions are equal, guess what? Out of all the technological breakthroughs that benefit mankind, <laughs> over 90% of all the technological breakthroughs come from that 30% group. Amazing, folks. The foundation of truth is God's word. I like this. When do you think man started measuring elevation? It wasn't until, I think, the 1600s, the barometer. Before that, the Bible's written, right? And in the Bible, it talks about going up to a city and down to a city and up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Well, before you knew how to measure elevation, man might have thought up meant north or down meant south. No, the Bible's talking about elevation. But man didn't know how to measure this. So if the Bible wasn't from God, what's the chances of it getting the proper this city's up or down from another city, what's the chances of it getting it right every single time? Well, if it's pure randomness, in other words, the Bible had a 50-50 chance of choosing up or down, that'd be two raised to the 100th power, okay? Well, so, in other words, incredibly small chance that the Bible could get all of them right. Science started measuring elevation and they found out what? That, that the Bible actually got it right a long time ago. Now we're gonna take a trip over to Bible lands. And I want you to notice the mountains around here. Imagine you were living right around Jerusalem right there. Take a look at the hills and valleys around there. 
We're going to circle around, look around the region around there, and see if you think you can get all the elevations correct every single time, up, down, up, down, up, down. Whether you're going to Egypt, whether you're going 500 miles north or 100 miles or 20 miles, or just 10 miles like in this picture. You can see the Mediterranean Sea over there. We'll rotate around. I mean, what's the chances of them getting the ups and downs right every single time? Not any chance unless it's from God, folks. Whether it's down into Egypt, down to, from Hebron to Sodom, whether they go up like Jacob did, Shechem, in Rogal, Ramoth Gilead, the Bible got it right every single time. Circumcision. Any of y'all remember what day Abraham was told to circumcise? Eighth day. Hmm. Why the eighth day? Well, science thinks it might have actually figured it out, but why the day eight? You know, you could figure out seven because there's seven days in a week. You can figure out 10 because you got 10 fingers or 10 toes. Maybe 40. 40 is a big number in the Bible, isn't it? Where'd eight come from? Not making sense. Well, God said, do it, so why argue with him, right? He said, do it on eighth day? Okay, eighth day. We didn't know why. Basically, though, when you do circumcision on a little boy, he needs to be able to clot blood. That's a minor surgery, okay, but you need to clot blood. Well, basically, clotting blood is an incredibly complex thing. I mean, it's incredibly complex. Couldn't possibly gotten here by evolution. But it requires at least three main ingredients. One of them is blood platelets. Well, you've got, you got plenty of blood platelets when you're born, so that's not a problem. The second thing is vitamin K. You got a little bit from your mother, not a problem. And the vitamin K helps produce the third one. It's called available prothrombin. The available prothrombin, when you're born, is right back here. See 100% of normal for a boy? When you're born... You're a little bit low, about 90%. If they circumcise you on this day, eh, only about one out of 400 babies have any problem. It's no big deal. If they circumcise you here, you're going to have a little bit more problem, right? But guess what happens? On the eighth day, you're at the highest you'll ever be in your entire life. It is the absolute best day for circumcision that you could ever chose. How did they know this? Did they know about available prothrombin 3,000 years ago? 4,000 years ago? No. God turned around and told him when to do it. He didn't have to tell him why. They just do it because he said it, okay? God picked the eighth day. Not experiments. The Bible got it right. Science finally figured it out. The Bible and hygiene, though. You all like washing your hands? You all like keeping things clean? Your parents tell you to do that all the time. Hygiene, keep things clean, right? Even today's cultures, uh, there are people who only live for 35, 40 years in many cultures. Why? Because they don't keep up with hygiene laws and cleanliness. What's the Bible say about hygiene laws and cleanliness? Well, let's see. Leprosy, even in the 17th, 18th century, people were going door to door selling wares, and they had leprosy. Whew. You wouldn't allow it today, would you? The Bible turns around and says the following. He told the Israelites when they walked out of Egypt, he says, if you follow my laws and my statutes, I'll put upon you none of the diseases upon, that came upon the Egyptians. Does that mean when the Israelites turned around and ate pork, the God was just going to zap the pork and take all the bad stuff out of it? No, he just told them not to eat pork. Very simple, folks. And pork's not a good thing to eat. Unless you cook it real, real well. That's what our theories are today, anyways. He promised them no terrible, none of these terrible diseases. They just follow what he said. Other cultures didn't follow what the Old Testament law says. What did they end up with? You wiped out about half the human race in those few years. 1918, influenza epidemic. How many Americans died? 21 million worldwide were killed almost a million in the United States alone. Could have easily been taken care of by hygiene laws from the Old Testament. No big deal. Isn't it there for our learning? Let's look what Leviticus chapter 15 says. When a person has a discharge, they're sick. Something's coming out of their nose, their skin, or whatever else. When they have this, every single bed that they lay upon is unclean. And if you go over and touch that bed, now you're unclean, and you've got to go wash yourself and stay away from other people. Isolation. It's pretty good hygiene laws, isn't it? Anyone who touches that person, they're unclean. If he spits on you, you're unclean. And even the food-type vessels he ate out of were considered as unclean in different types. Great hygiene laws. Man didn't catch up with this until the last 150 years. What happens when man doesn't start with the Old Testament hygiene laws. Well, what happened to George Washington? He shouldn't have died, folks, at least not at that time. He came down, maybe a cold flu, things of that nature. Even evolutionists would say, yeah, he was sick, he shouldn't have died. But they believed in that blood, you know, whenever you're sick, 
There must be an imbalance between uh, a couple of different things. One of them being blood. So they bleed you. They, they cut your skin right here, stick some leeches on you, and let it suck out some of your blood. That's what they did to George Washington. He's sick, slit the wrist just a little lightly, suck him some blood out that time. Hmm, didn't get any better. We must need to bleed him some more. So they bled him some more and he died. And today they said, you know, they shouldn't have bled him. You see, the Bible turns around and says in Leviticus chapter 17, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you'd really honor what God said, you'd be very cautious about doing anything to that blood. Okay. What about this guy? Germ theory of disease? Ignaz Semmelweis, considered as a doctor who made the greatest breakthrough in all of medical science. What was this breakthrough? 1840s. He'd been a doctor for a few years. He got assigned to the most famous hospital in the world in Vienna. He worked on the maternity ward, pregnant women. And what really bothered him the most is about one out of every six women died. And his doctors couldn't figure out, why are these women dying? we got 300 some women on my ward. i got 50 to 60 women die every single month. I mean, after all, we're educated. We're doctors. You know, we should be able to take care of this problem. You know what's really embarrassing for them? There's a whole other section of the hospital where there's a maternity ward, no doctors, just midwives, and a whole lot less died over there. So here are these doctors with all their education, and these midwives without any education are just blowing them away. Women were scared of even going to the hospital because people just died, okay? So one out of six. It, was, it wasn't good. So as he's going around one time, he came up with all kinds of theories to try to figure out why these women were dying. I mean, some wild theories. Maybe we need to turn the women on their side. Or maybe we need to stop the loud noise that's scaring the spirits out of them when such and such. I mean, just weird theories. Finally, one day, he says, you know, doctors, what do they do? When they come to work in the morning, they go down to the mortuary, the morgue. You know, people died in the last day. And they go down to do autopsies. They cut open dead bodies. And they put their hands into dead, rotting flesh. They do autopsies, right? Then they wash off their hands without soap, no antiseptic, just plain old water, wipe it off on something, and come up and do pelvic exams on pregnant women. No wonder they died. They didn't know anything about hygiene, folks. So he said, perhaps doctors are carrying something onto my maternity ward from the dead bodies. And that's causing my live patients to die. Dead, die. Okay, maybe that's it. So he took some water, put some heavy chlorine in it. It smelled really bad. Okay. And had all the doctors, when they came on to his ward, they had to wash their hands in this heavy chlorinated water, which made their hands chap and stunk. All oh, the doctors couldn't stand this. They thought he was a quack. He's a nut. Get rid of this doctor. Guess what happened? The month before he made them wash their hands, the typical 57 people, 57 women died out of the 340. A month after he made them all wash their hands, only eight died. That's good science, folks. That's testable, repeatable science. 57 down to eight, something happened. This is fantastic. And then he started making the doctors wash their hands between every single patient because he noticed some people picked up something from one patient and carried it to the next. And so guess what happened a month after that? Only four died. Scientifically, you come up with something that goes from 57 to 4, you say 53 lives, that's a good breakthrough. The greatest breakthrough in all of medical science. And he's a scientist. And scientists taught, we're unbiased. We don't have any biases. If the data says it, we'll follow it. These are medical doctors. They all love helping people, healing people, right? Guess what the scientists did? They ridiculed him, made fun of him, wouldn't even let him keep his job, and got him kicked and fired out of the whole town. He couldn't find a job in any hospital in all of Vienna. I guess they didn't like their hands getting chapped. They didn't like the smell. Didn't fit their theories. Guess what happened when they threw out his wash basins, his chlorine, things of that nature, went back up to 50-some dying every month? Did they change? No. Women just kept dying. Science, unfortunately, is done by scientists, and we are biased. They were biased. There's nothing new today, folks. You go from 57 to 4, they should have woke up. By the way, he went to another city, finally got a job, instituted the same things in that city in Budapest, got the same results, fantastic results. 